Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to be talking about the withering away of the state. The Marxist concept of a withering away of the state. So, this is my understanding of this, of course. I will just be doing this without a script. Just, uh, you know, I could, I could just give you tons of quotations from Marx and stuff, or Engels, or Lenin. But, you know, if you want that, then you can go read the critique of the Gotha program. And you can go read the State and the Revolution. The State and Revolution is actually a little bit better because it actually... A lot of, a lot of it is just summarizing the uh, critique of the Gotha program. So it, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. But basically, the withering away of the State means that after the State becomes unnecessary, it withers away because the Marxist understanding is that you need what's called uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat. That is, the capitalist society is a dictatorship of the capitalists because the capitalists control everything. They control the economy, they control politics, everything is run by capitalists. So therefore, when the revolution happens, the workers need to take power, create their own society which is controlled by the workers instead of controlled by the capitalists. So instead of being a capitalist dictatorship, it's the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, this dictatorship, it doesn't mean that it's, you know, one party rule necessarily. It doesn't mean that it's one person rule. It's just, you know, that's not what it means by dictatorship. Okay, so this dictatorship, this, this state, what is a state? State is basically just a bunch of armed people. It's a bunch of oppressive mechanisms. It's the police, it's the military, um, the bureaucracy, all that stuff. Now, there's a certain function for all that. Why do you need the, uh, need the military, for example? Well, you need the, the, you need the military because there's other countries that might be hostile to you, so you need to defend yourself. Um, why do you need the police? Well, you need the police, you know, the capitalists will say that it's because of the, there's criminals. But the bigger reason is really because there's poor people. There's a bunch of capitalists who are rich, and then there's a bunch of poor people, and the poor people are looking at all that wealth, and they're thinking to themselves, hmm, you know, there's all this money, I could just take that, and then I could be happy. You know, I'm hungry, I could take that, and I could buy some, buy me some food. So the police are there to stop that from happening. Um, then there's all kinds of, you know, of course, there's other kinds of crime. There's like, crime is is created by poverty, basically, because there's no other opportunities, people turn to crime. But then there's the rare, more rare kinds of crime, like somebody just, somebody is insane, so they're, they go on a rampage. You know, that's pretty rare. Then there's, you know, all kinds of crimes, like so-called crimes of passion, like somebody insults another person, so the other person gets really mad and kills the other guy. Or somebody's wife cheats on him, so he gets really mad and murders the wife. I mean, that's relatively rare. Most crime is caused by poverty. It's like people are stealing stuff, people are doing burglaries, robberies, bank robberies, selling drugs, and then there's gang violence, you know, stuff like that. So, essentially, like, you need, in capitalism, you need the police to protect the private property of rich people and then it, you also need it to basically stop civil unrest because capitalism in order to function it needs needs you know safety you can't really can't can't do business if there's like crazy violence going on all the time society needs to be pretty stable so that's another function of the police force now, that said, it's pretty obvious that the police force is an oppressive instrument. So, in order to get rid of the police force, you need to get rid of the conditions that, you know, make it necessary to have a police force. So, you need to have social equality. So, if you get rid of poverty, there's no more poor people, people don't do crime anymore. Okay, there's still going to be the odd, you know, 
crimes of passion, and then there's going to be like people who are just insane. But it's not going to be rampant. You don't necessarily need this crazy, highly organized, militarized police force. It's you know it'll be enough if you just have maybe like a people's militia. It'll be enough to take care of the occasional crazy person who just gets violent for no reason or settle small grievances like okay he insulted me well um, you know that gets settled or if there's like a drunken brawl the militia can just go there and be like you know boys stop it you don't need this you know oppressive arm of the state to do that in communism then there's the military well communism is supposed to be global so if there's no other countries you don't really need the military to protect your your country from another country that's pretty obvious but even if it's not totally global like let's just assume that for example north america is not uh, socialist or communist let's say it's still capitalist but if china india africa and europe australia and every other place on the planet is socialist or communist then the Americans don't really, you know, they're on the losing side, clearly. They're not very powerful anymore. So in a, in a situation like that, I'm pretty sure that the communist um, federation of the rest of the planet could just get rid of the military. Um, you know, a voluntary army of some kind would be enough to protect it. Um, but if it's just one country, like the Soviet Union, or Cuba or something, then they can't get rid of the military. It's too risky. But you know, when it's when it uh, when the revolution spreads, then they can get rid of the military. It's pretty obvious. You know, it's pretty easy to understand. Then there's another aspect of it. There's the economic aspect. Communism is thought to be a stage of post scarcity, of superabundance. What does that mean? That means that there's more than enough stuff for everyone to use because basically in capitalism and in socialism there's still scarcity so there's a certain amount of food to go around there's a certain amount of every other kind of product to go around so people have this idea that in capitalism there's no rationing but there actually is rationing the rationing is done by you know with money so basically, if you have money, then you can buy stuff. If the you know if they run out, then you have to pay more than the other person, and then you can still have the stuff. So that's how capitalism rations um, products. In socialism, they might do it differently. They're like, okay, everybody needs to have food. This is not a question of you know who has the most money. We just it's a priority that everyone has food. So how do we do this? We do this by rationing food, for example, or clothes, or you know, special kinds of medication, or something like that. But in communism, the idea is that productive forces would be so developed that they could produce so much that there would be enough for everyone without any kind of rationing. So you wanna you wanna like I don't know, eat like a Big Mac every day. We don't need to ration Big Macs, we can produce enough Big Macs so that everyone can eat one a day. I know that's a stupid example, but it's, you know, just an example. And in a lot of ways, we are already there. If we just changed the distribution of things a little bit and did it with planning, then we are pretty much already there. We can produce a crazy amount of stuff. So the other aspect of that is that people have to learn to not take stuff they don't really need. Like, uh, you don't, you don't want to go to the store and take a new TV every day and just throw the old one into the, into the garbage, you know. If there's a, there's a TV in the store, it, it's promised that this TV will last you for five years, and after five years, it's, it's reasonable for you to get a new one, then most people would take that, they would use it for roughly five years and then get a new one. If, uh, if that doesn't work, if people just take all this shit and just waste it all, then we're going to have to resort back to rationing. So the rationing is going to be a transitional phase. And we're going to monitor people, you know, their consumer habits, see how many TVs are being used, 
and you know eventually it should all work out we could get rid of rationing get rid of this consumer monitoring and all, all this and just you know it would work out you know who knows you could, you could come up with all kinds of systems to fix this like maybe in order to get a new tv you would bring the old tv you know and recycle it or something basically the point is that instead of instead of uh, surplus value that would be so-called surplus product because surplus value is this idea that you make products as a worker those products are sold which realizes their value then the corporation gets the gets money for it and pays you a wage and then uh, out of that money they take a cut and that's you know that's the surplus value in socialism it would be pretty much the same thing you work for a corporation like a socialist enterprise they make something some kind of products maybe cars or something the car gets sold to a consumer you earn a wage um, corporation gets money and it's used to you know benefit the society it's, it doesn't go to the difference is that it, it doesn't go to a private capitalist it goes to benefit the society as a whole and build up build up productive forces and move us closer to communism but in communism it would be different in communism you work you don't get a wage um, you just work for free but then on the other hand you don't need to pay for products either you can just, you can just go to the store and get whatever you need for free um, so surplus product means that you know assuming you're like a coal miner or let's say you're a steel miner how much steel do you think you can mine in a year I don't know let's say like 10 tons of steel I don't I have no idea so how much steel do you think that you are gonna use personally in a year maybe like one ten thousandth of that of that or something so that leaves like 999,999, you know, kilos of steel for everyone else per one steel worker every year or something like that. That means there's like this 9999999 kilo um, surplus product. Same goes for like if you're like a sugar, I don't know, a sugar cane farmer. You farm sugar cane. How much sugar are you, gonna, are you gonna use personally in a year? I don't know, probably like, I don't know, 10 kilos maybe, I, I have no idea. Um, so again, how much how much can you actually grow in a, or harvest in a year? I don't know, just like hundreds of tons or something. So again, it leaves like a surplus product of these hundreds of tons of sugar. So see how it actually goes. Same goes for food. Somebody who's a farmer, they eat, like one one hundredth of what they can actually grow everything else is surplus this surplus is um, you know goes to the society and if the surplus is high enough then uh, you know we don't we don't need any kind of rationing there's enough for everyone and if it's if we can really produce a lot then we get to post scarcity which means that we don't even we don't need any kind of rationing anyone can just take however much stuff we the you know they want but it just there's still enough that we're, we're producing more than people can even can reasonably consume that even if you you consume without a care in the world you still cannot you know reasonably consume so much that we would run out you know but as i said like if you if you were to take like a new 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 car every day and just smash it into a building and then get another one the next day you know i'm sure that that way we would actually run out if everyone did that but it's not really reasonable to think that everyone would do that there might be the occasional crazy person who would do that but you know we would uh, you know sort him out we would have to put him into a straight jacket or something and put an end to that but that's the idea of, of post scarcity now this situation results in uh, political power ceasing to exist basically but Marx says that political power itself will cease to exist proletarian democracy itself will cease to exist now what what does that mean 
it means that basically because there's no military there's no police there's no state there's no countries there's no money so what is there there's just a bunch of a bunch of people working in these these um, you know collective farms um, collectively owned enterprises working for free getting all the stuff for free instead of like in socialism a corporation would maybe they would buy products from other socialist corporations or in an ideal ideal situation and this is what often happened for example a some kind of agricultural you know plant some kind of let's say a collective farm they would maybe barter with another plant and they would you know they would trade because the let's say the agricultural plant needs tractor parts and then the factory needs some kind of some kind of agricultural product i don't know like flax or something they would they would barter instead of using money but in communism they would just give this stuff they're like okay in order for industry to function industry needs the product that our plant produces and in order for our plant to function we need the some of the product of this other plant so they're going to give it to us and you know for that in order for that plant to function they need the products of these plants and you know it would just work like that of course this would all have to be done in a you know according to a common plan you can't just have one plant deciding oh we're not going to give give stuff to this other plant but then again why would they like in socialism they might refuse to hand over their product because they could sell it for money so if there was no plan then that might happen but in communism there's no money so why would they hold on to their product if they don't need it if they can give it away why wouldn't they so the same applies to everything else this is how political power itself ceases to exist how can you have power if there's no money if there's no material wealth in general like everyone has all the material wealth that they want so how can you bribe someone someone for example you cannot what could you possibly offer them and for what purpose you know you couldn't for example say okay well i'm gonna give you money so that you're gonna you know give me a bunch of these you know raw materials that are actually owned by the state but you're gonna give them to me instead and i'm gonna sell them on the black market so then we can both be rich you know that wouldn't work because there's no money to give and even if there was why would you even use money because everything is free anyway you could get a gun and threaten someone but there's the there's the militia and the militia is gonna get you but of course you you might be thinking okay i'm, gonna, I'm just gonna get myself a mercenary army well what are you gonna pay them with because there's no money there's no material wealth that you could offer them so maybe one or two people could get get guns and just go crazy but they couldn't create like a mercenary army or something that could actually threaten the militia in other words the entire non-crazy population which is just armed and ready then all kinds of positions like director of a factory or i don't know like somebody who runs some kind of a some kind of office some kind of administrative function those would basically all just become ad administrative functions instead of these positions of prestige and privilege that get you all kinds of benefits and lead to corruption. That wouldn't happen because, you know, there's no material wealth. Now, how would we select people for these posi positions? Um, nobody really knows. Like, we could elect them or we could just nominate someone who is seen to be the most capable, you know, or people might we might like have somebody be the factory director for a year, then change it, somebody else be the director for a year. Who knows? Nobody really knows because we haven't really reached communism ever, so this is all kind of up for, up for debate. We don't really know what exactly works the best, so, you know, it's not set in stone. But that's basically the idea. That's how we get rid of the state, reach post-scarcity, and get to stateless communism. Now, anarchists, they would like to get to stateless communism immediately, but it's not really doable. And the reason why it's not doable is because even if you don't want to create a state, the state is going to be created and recreated. 
out of the conditions that it exists in. You know, in capitalism, the police is there to basically keep poor people in check. In socialism, the police is basically to keep the people who used to be rich, to keep them in check, to keep the right-wingers in check. So, if the country, if you have a revolution, then the country is full of these people who used to be rich, who are right-wing, who hate you, hate everything about you, and they want to have a counter-revolution and restore capitalism, how do you get rid of the police force? Or the secret police, secret service, intelligence service, whatever. Well, the anarchists say, okay, we, we, we don't need it, we don't really need it, we just get rid of it. Well, you know, how's that working out for you? Besides, I mean, that's bullshit anyway. I mean, Magno had a secret police, Catalonia had the same exact thing. They had prison camps for political, political prisoners. So, don't give me any of that shit, oh, we we'll just get rid of it, because we don't really need it. I mean, bullshit, you need it. And if you really got rid of it, then you would be screwed. An unprofessional militia is not exactly enough for... Like, if, if the US is funding some kind of terrorist army, or like a terrorist paramilitary in your country, then, you know, you're gonna need something to fight that. Your, your militia is not gonna be enough. The same is for national defense. If you're fighting like against the US army or something something of the same scale, then the militia just doesn't cut it. You're gonna need tanks, airplanes, helicopters, artillery, probably even nuclear weapons. Your, you know, ragtag militia of unprofessional, just r regular everyday citizens is not gonna be enough. Because we're, we're not talking about dealing with some, you know, random crazy guy. Some random crazy individual. No, we're talking about fighting a powerful, professional capitalist army. They've got tanks, we need tanks. They've got professional tank drivers, we need professional tank drivers. They got a centralized command, we need centralized command. They got an intelligence service, we need an intelligence service. We need a better intelligence service than they, so, so that we win. We need, a, we need better tanks, more professional tank drivers, better military academies. Same goes for the economic uh, things. You cannot get rid of the state, and you cannot get rid of money if there's still scarcity. Because anarchists kind of got rid of money in a half-assed way. They got rid of money, but they... I mean, in some places they got rid of money. In, in Catalonia, they still used money, but they just got rid of it in some place. Like, in some villages, they got rid of, the, rid of money, but money was still used uh, nationwide. And then, when they get rid of money, they replace it with labor certificates or something like that, which is basically the same thing. It's still money. They just don't call it money, but it's money. I mean, the, the real, real substan substantial difference between labor certificates and money is that you can earn money by selling stuff, you can earn money by, you know, owning stocks. Labor certificates you only get for, from labor, so that's, that's the only riff. That's the only difference. Of course, you can still sell labor certificates on the black market or, so, or something, but that's the difference. But it's still money. You can only get rid of money in post-scarcity. You know, because otherwise there's just going to be a black market and capitalism is going to be restored. You know, people won't necessarily be using money. They might just revert back to, like, using gold or they might use something else as a currency. They might use US dollars because if the anarchist um, territory doesn't have its own currency, then they might just use US dollars or something. Or they might just barter, you know, but nonetheless, all kinds of trading and stuff like that would be happening. It wouldn't wouldn't be the same as um, post-scarcity stateless communism where everything is just free and people just cooperate and there's no, no profit-seeking. So, trying to abolish the state overnight is stupid. It's not gonna work. It cannot be abolished. So that's my explanation of uh, withering of the state. That's based on my understanding of, uh, of the subject. So if you think I am mistaken, then feel free to point it out in the comments. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I will try to answer them uh, as best I can and all that stuff. So anyway, I thank you for watching and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.